Welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, Your First Day. Everyone was new to the game at some point, and some need more help than others. This video series is here to supplement your adventure and guide you through this brand new experience. Together we're gonna go through the game from startup and slowly through the game as a whole. I'll be pointing out the important bits as we go through. The game is huge and I'll be sure to point you out to what you should be focusing on, getting distracted for, and common mistakes new players will make. Ideally, this is made for people who've never played the game before, and has either bought the game or is playing the free trial, but we'll be skipping right past all of that account management and installing, and getting right into the game itself. You're going to lose yourself in this world, but let me help you along the way so you don't get lost. But just remember the following. Things can always change, and things become outdated. I recommend reading the description below for any addendums, and possibly the comments for others. The game updates every three and a half months or so, so anything can change at any time, and much more major changes with expansions. But let's get into it. This is going to be the most dense part of the game, since everything might be new to you, and there are so many little things to know or make note of even as early as level 1. I'll try and make liberal use of the chapter select function and timestamps to make jumping around possible for if you see something important that you yourself don't know and want to find out about. But upon booting up the game we naturally have the title screen. If we wait here for a bit without interacting, we get a title sequence. If you've not done so, watch the scene for A Realm Reborn. If you own the expansions already, you'll get a different video, but you can find this one in the Movies and Titles option menu. This isn't just some cool video to set the mood, this is part of the actual story, and much of the game revolves around this one event in Aeosia's history. But when that is over, we can start the game. To begin, we have to create a character. You can play as human, giraffe, potato, cat girl, shrek, or insect that people think is a dragon with the base game. Purchase of Shadowbringers or any expansions afterward will let you be shrek in a fursuit and a Lola Bunny. For the purposes of this series, I will go with Shrek in a fursuit, if for one purpose only. These guys and the bunnies can't wear that many hats. There's a lot of hats they just can't use in any way. Well, they work as equipment, so you aren't at a gameplay disadvantage, but many people will tell you that glamour is the true endgame, and with limited hat options, people tend to be unhappy with these races. But, that aside, all of the races have a lot of different customization options. Spend as much time as you can on this as you need. Make a character you are absolutely happy with. There is only one time you can change the entire look of your character for free, and it's at level 50. So pick a race, gender, and overall look you are happy with, as well as pick a name you are happy with. Even after purchasing the game, look and name change have a further cost. So unless you have money to burn besides the main game costs, be extra sure here. If nothing else, you can hit the generate name button to get some lore friendly name ideas. And for reference, all of your choices here are purely for looks. Each race is no stronger than the others, and your guardian deity has no implication on gameplay. But when we get to our starting class, this does have some effect on the start of the game. We can change classes very early into the game, but we should still pick one we like the idea of to start. We have eight choices split across three different starting towns. No matter which starting town you end up in, all three will follow the same exact major story beats. Only the minor story beats will change. 
In Ulda, you might deliver cookies to some orphans, while in Gridania, you tend to some chocobos or such. And all three stories will meet up at level 15, and for our purposes, I'll be choosing my main, Lancer. And as such, we'll be starting in Gridania. But we have one more thing to choose besides this. Our server. Some will be locked due to high traffic. They will be grayed out. Come back at nighttime, say like 3am, you may be able to join these servers. Any with a star are preferred, which means they are generally lower population than most, but not low enough that you won't have plenty of people to play with. The benefit of picking one of these servers is a double EXP buff up to level 70, lasting for around 90 days, regardless of the amount of playtime you have. But you hardly need that buff. The benefits are just that. Benefits? Hardly all that needed. It's just extra experience points, and a one-time gill bonus, and also 15 days of free playtime for your first character hitting level 15. Which, if you're in the free trial, that's kind of irrelevant. If nothing else, you might choose one of these just for the free 15 days of playtime. Don't let that completely influence your decision, though. Pick one you like the name of, the bonuses, whatever, but in the end, it's all the same. You can change it later if you really want or need to, at a cost. More important is the data center. All servers are grouped in clusters of servers called data centers. All players within a data center will play with each other through duties and other sources. You can even visit other worlds at will. So that's just more reason to pick the specific server you want, as every other server in your data center will still be able to play with you. But with that chosen, we're finally ready to head into the game. That is, if we don't get into a queue to enter the game. These sometimes happen when a lot of people playing a game, especially around patch time. But they're almost always extremely short, even when it's a longer queue. But we finally get in and immediately get thrown into some cutscenes. The story is absolutely the main draw of the game, and this first set of cutscenes is far more important than you realize until much later. This game has a very heavy emphasis on foreshadowing. But no matter which path we took, we get an introduction to characters, the world, and its problems. Here you'll also get your first multiple choice question. Your answers to these very rarely ever matter to anything, but sometimes it gives you an easter egg, like in this intro. But finally we'll reach our destination, and get our first tastes of movement. We can use either controller or keyboard, and if nothing else, I recommend all console players have a cheap USB keyboard available. You may not ever use it for gameplay, but to chat with people, you really want a keyboard. Whichever we pick, we'll get our first active help, telling us the basics of movement, and we'll get to try it out. But take a quick note at this tiny little checkbox here. Disable all active help windows. Do not touch this! I mean it. There is absolutely no reason to ever turn these windows off. Other than it being an alt character, perhaps. But as a first time player, there is no reason at all ever to touch it. I've dealt with many, many questions over the years and many of them are actually answered in these active help windows. I'm going to point out a few choice things to know, despite active helps actively being active, and if neither of these help, or if you accidentally skip one, or close the windows by accident, active helps can be reopened at any time by opening the menu. But back to business, we need to talk to the person who called out to us as we entered town. Our very first quest has us in our own little world. All other plays are invisible to us, and we are invisible to them. So don't bother trying to contact your friends just yet, if you already have any. So walk up to them and get another act of help. But this one we have to click with the mouse, or the trackpad on the PS4 controller. 
This is how just about all future active helps will appear. Like I said, keep it on and be sure to read them all without exception, even if it's something you think you already know. You probably don't. We pick up our first quest officially and have a simple task. Walk to the local Adventurers Guild, and that's it. What this active help doesn't tell you is that if you click on the blue text describing your goal, it will open up the map and show you exactly where you need to go. This is a different quest than the one we're currently on, but it makes for a much better showing of this in action. But we head on forward, get made fun of for a name, learn that Gridania is extremely xenophobic, and finally enter the world with everyone else, along with our first level up. One of very, very, very many. But we have our next very important active help. There are four general types of quest icons. We won't be seeing one of them for a very long time, but of these, the important ones for now are basic side quests with yellow icons, the main quest with a fancy border in the shape of the meteor, and blue icons with a plus symbol. The plus symbol means that it is a side quest that unlocks some kind of content, and some way more important than others. Don't worry, I'll be mentioning these, but in general, pick up the blue quests whenever you see one. And one more important thing to mention, look at the top left. This is the scenario guide. This will, at all times, tell you where to find your next main story objective. And underneath it, the more important quests, clicking the buttons will show you the locations of these quests. Again, the story is the main focus of the game, so it gets an entire UI element. We'll get back to why the smaller part is actually the more important quest later. For now, I said how this gets a UI element, so I'm going to say now you should customize your UI. There's a couple of general things that basically aren't optional changes or go over in a minute, but do go through all of the options menus now. There's many, many, many things you'll want to check out, but I'll give a Cliff Notes versions of the things I personally think are worth checking. Open up the character configuration and swap immediately to Legacy Controls and try it out. The biggest difference between the two is obvious when you try to hold down the S key, or down on the stick. Standard has you walk backward very slowly. Legacy, you actually run in the direction you hold down. Pick your poison, but I'm going to be going Legacy, and keeping both checkboxes on. I've played this way all my game time, and I could never go to Standard. Camera movement is just so much better for me. Next, I'm off to movement keybinds. I'm getting rid of the turn left and right keys. I have no use for these, and putting the strafe keys onto A and D. All future movement you see out of me will be under this specific control scheme. If I do some kind of movement you have no idea how I managed, this is how. Back in character configuration in hotbar settings, we need to turn on a third hotbar for specifically just skills. All but perhaps one job in the game needs a full three hotbars to fit everything. Also, go into the sharing tab and be sure to have the checkbox next to hotbar 3 unchecked. I'll be using all ten hotbars myself, as there's a lot of other stuff besides job skills to use. Back to keybinds again. We need to add hotkeys to this third hotbar. Control, Alt, and Shift all work as modifiers. If you want deeper insights into why I have mine set up as I do, I made a video explaining my setup, linked on the screen and in the description. And finally, back to character configuration, let's change our item settings. Open all for inventory interface makes the inventory way more manageable. And just to make sure you don't ignore system settings, I'll mention I keep my game in borderless windowed and capped at 60 frames per second. And then let's finish off with going into the HUD layout menu. Using on the numpad number keys, you can move every element one pixel at a time. You can also use control plus home or on the controller R3 
To cycle the size of each element of the UI, you can click the gear icon to be able to select the size via drop down menu, but this shortcut works on just about everything, including windows like inventory or the social windows. This is the area we use to move stuff around, and you'll notice when I show the finished UI, I moved a lot around. The only big thing you might not have figured out how to move it is to click and drag the general tab to move the chat box. But that's the absolute Cliff Notes version of things I will be changing. One special note I'll leave off on though is back in system settings. The final section is accessibility settings. There are some mechanics in the game that are based on sound. Visual alerts will add indicators to these attacks, which will help out the hearing impaired. And then we also have colorblind filtering. Don't try these out if you aren't colorblind in any way, because some of the settings generally hurt my eyes to look at, and may hurt your eyes to look at. But if you have issues with colors, try them out. They might be helpful to you. And be sure to post on the official forums with any other accessibility needs you might have, as if they don't know about the issues, they can't add anything to fix them. But, after spending a couple hours on your UI, you're finally ready to continue. So accept this quest and let's move on. This time we've been given a few tasks, including Aetherites and your guild, and get introduced to the Novice Hall. Talking to the Smith, they inform you of the Novice Network. You can contact a player with a crown to invite you, or you'll randomly be invited by one as you play the game. Your mileage may vary with this system. Mentors are players too, and just because they wear the crown does not mean they know what they should. They are also not perfect even when they are good mentors. Not everyone knows everything. I make it a point to know as much as I can, but even I don't know absolutely everything. Keep these things in mind if you join the Novice Network. Nobody is perfect, and not everyone can know everything there is. Some servers may have good novice networks, others can be terrible, but it's worth a shot I'd say. You may make some friends and learn things along the way. If anyone becomes too... let's just kindly say they're a bit too rude, you can report them from the support desk in the menu. If nothing else, there's plenty of other social options though they might be equally rude. And if you're on free trial, you don't really have many options. But you do have the option of Novice Network no matter what. Either way, now is probably the best time to contact any of your friends who invited you to play the game. But social stuff aside, we have a game to play. Our first objective is the Aetherite Crystal. Attuning to these big crystals should be one of our top priorities. Everywhere we go, this should be the number one thing we should look out for. Every major town will have one of these, and most smaller towns too. Attuning to these allows us to teleport between every Aetherite we have attuned to. It costs a sum of gil, our money in the series, to do so. The distance between Aetherites matter though, up to a maximum of 999 gil for a single teleport. You'll get plenty of money along the way, so don't worry about that too much. Just remember to attune to one whenever you get near one. But for this first one, we learn to be able to return. On a long 15 minute cooldown, we can return to this Aetherite any time we use return. And later when we find more Aetherites, we can change our home point that we return to. Return is something you're going to want to make heavy use of. But that won't be until we leave town. For now, we're still in it and we have lots of town to explore. And more you should aim to pick up. If you open your actions window and go to general actions, we can find sprint. Which, in everything you do, is something you should basically be using on cooldown. Solo and in dungeons, this increases your walk speed by about 30% and it lasts for 20 seconds. That's pretty significant since we need to explore the entire town for these mini Aetherites. We can teleport between the main Aetherite 
and the minis as much as we want to quickly get around town. When you pass by one of these, grab it. Next up though is the market area. Here we can buy and sell to vendors, and we can also buy off the market board, but we can't sell yet. And if you're free trial, you can never sell on the market board, but you could still buy. We have no money anyway, and no reason to buy anything, so let's move quickly past this to the guild. No matter which guild you belong to, you must officially join them. And that's because these quests are more important than the main story itself. As I said earlier, there's a quest below the main story. Prioritize this quest where you can, because they can be class quests or other important quests that unlock features. Sometimes extremely key features of the game. Pick up that quest, but for now, let's finish going around town and finish collecting the Aetherites. You'll know when you found them all when the option to instantly teleport outside into the field and to the airship port appears. See how useful this was? Not only did you explore the town and figure out the layout a little bit, but you got a little reward for it. And quickly I'll detour a tip about mail. You and your friends can use mail moogles to mail letters and items to each other, but there's plenty of rewards from Square themselves that also appear here. As a longtime player, I have a lot. Veteran rewards, pre-order bonuses, and more. If you start paying for the game, expect a lot of stuff out of this little guy. But that's not why I took this detour. For one, I got several mounts. I can't use any of them because we need to get our first mount before we can use any others. Secondly, watch me try on these hats. Notice that some of them don't appear. This is what I warned you about earlier for Hrothgar and Viera. The stats of any hats and helmets will still work, but as far as visual, there's a lot of hats we can't wear. If I'm not wearing something on my head, this will be why. Keep an eye out for that. And also, you can manually turn off helmets with a button in your character profile. I won't be using this, so if I'm missing a helmet, it's the game, not me using this option. But let's get back to the story. Our checklist is done, and now we're immediately blocked from continuing. We have to level up before we can. So now we have a few options to gain levels. We passed by plenty of side quests along the way we can do. Some of them also give pieces of gear. But I personally am going to go out and do my first class quest from the guild and get a taste of combat. At this level we have... one whole button. If you need class tutorials, I have guides of all of them. Check the link playlist in the description. I chose the class quest for one specific reason though. For completing it, we get the Hunt Log. This is the first of many important rewards from our class, and every class has one. Hunt Logs are the list of enemies to kill for some nice experience bonuses. On the way to level 15, this is a huge source of experience. If you see a Hunt Log enemy, kill it. But no matter how you hit level 4, you'll probably reach level 5 too or maybe even six with hunt log bonuses, as our story makes us head off into another area. On the way to our quest objective, we may run into our first fate. These are simple objectives that occasionally pop up in the area. They offer experience and some guilt to anyone who participates. We'll get more rewards out of them later, but for now, those are the two important parts. Complete these as you pass by them if you'd like some rewards as you're traveling. They can also be a fun distraction, and often events are tied to them. But eventually we have to reach our objective, and we're going to get a couple of firsts out of it. To start, this will be the first quest with multiple rewards in which we have to pick one, and only one item as reward. This is going to be extremely common as we go on. We can't complete the quest unless we pick one item. Secondly, the reward is going to be an item with actual stats to it, where our starting gear does not have any stats. 
if you open your character panel, you can hover over all stats to see what stats you want. But there's main stats at the top, and substats below. The main stats up top are the ones to be concerned with when picking gear. Until you get to max level and try to do min-maxing and stuff, pick whatever has more main stats. Twitch, as a lancer, I want strength and only strength. All other main stats will do nothing. Well, vitality will increase everyone's health, but otherwise every single class only has one main stat. A healer will only use mind, a mage will only use intelligence. You get the picture. You only have one important main stat. But finally, the last thing to make extremely important note of is item levels. The level to equip an item and the item level are completely different stats. So far, everything has been item level 5, despite wearing it since level 1. These boots that I just picked up are level 5 and item level 5. But look at the earring I got from pre-ordering Shadowbringers. It functionally changes based on my actual level, but visually, it's eye level 290, despite being wearable at level 1. The long and short of it is, higher eye level means better gear, where higher level is not always stronger. But it's not that simple either, and we'll get into that when it becomes relevant. The last part is especially important because the story expects us now to upgrade our main gear to all be eye level 5 or above. We're missing a hat right now, so we should head back to town and do any side quests that have a helmet. Like perhaps our class quest! That's what I'm going to be doing, but you could check out any other side quests around for a helmet. But you need to do your class quest anyway, so you may want to choose that for the helmet. Whichever way you get your gear, it's doing this because you now have to do your first solo duty. This will be similar to all other duties you do alone, and especially similar to the other starting zones. When your allies in these fights tell you to do something, do it. If they tell you to attack certain enemies first, do it. This is advice that will take you all the way up to level cap. This includes as we continue to progress and get another solo duty before level 10. In all solo duties, if allies tell you to do something, listen to them. They're not telling you wrong. But either way, at some point along the way, we'll be getting more skills and our first roll action. So at this point, I'll talk about the difference between a global cooldown and an off-global cooldown. Just about everything marked as a spell or weapon skill shares the same cooldown of 2.5 seconds. Use any of these and they all go on cooldown. That is why it is called a global cooldown. It globally puts all skills on the cooldown, despite being different skills. Off global cooldowns are off the global cooldown. They have longer timers and are usually marked as abilities. These can be used between GCDs. So in my case, True Thrust, Life Surge, Vorpal Thrust. And this has no pauses between attacks, no interruptions between GCDs. Always aim to keep your GCD rolling in combat. If you're pausing or wasting time otherwise, pick up the pace! If you need practice, there's striking dummies that you have certainly passed by up to this point. Each starting area does have some. To end combat with one, right click the HP bar and hit the reset enmity button. Ultimately though, please read all of your tooltips of all abilities you have. Ignoring any tooltips can lead to big problems later. Make your best effort to understand all of your skills and what they do. And quickly we'll hit level 10, another class quest, and some more big unlocks. A lot of them at that. The first is the inn. Most of the features we can't use yet, but take a second to explore. And if you're like me and had like 30 mail from rewards, this armor will let you empty your inventory of all the items that are meant for looks and not stats. 
The next important unlock is leave quests. The first quest will take you to a nearby area to continue it, and you should pick it up now as your next story quest is also going to take you around the same area. Head forward, pick up the Aetherite nearby, and talk to the next quest NPC. Leave quests are special quests you have limited allowances for. In general, these are better for gatherer and crafting classes, but every area has trial leaves to unlock the area's leaves. When you accept a leave quest, you'll get a separate entry in your journal for the leave itself. Head to the green circle marked on the map and open the leave in your journal to start it. You have to hit this initialize button to begin the leave. No other quests really have this. You'll just walk up to it and begin the quest. Leaves you manually have to begin. All battle and gatherer leaves work like this. Pick up the leave, go to the location, and hit initiate. Battle leaves are only worth it up to around level 15, but you'll still have plenty of leave unlocks to do with battling as you progress. And you'll gain 3 leave allowances every 12 hours, for a total of 6 every day. But after completing the first leave, you'll unlock Guild Hests. These are like little mini tutorial instances, and this will further teach you to listen to NPCs when they give you orders, as some of them you can't complete unless you listen to what the NPC tells you to do. You have to do each one to unlock the next test, and they go all the way up to level 40. These are sort of a leftover of the game we had at the start, but these still work to be a good introduction to party content, which as we see, Getting a party for party content is very easy. Just open the duty finder, choose the duty we want to do, and join a queue. The game will set us up with a full party in no time. Even if you don't get it immediately, you can walk around and do other stuff while you wait. Progress the story, for example. When we get in and complete a duty, we have the option of using a commendation over in our notices panel. You can give your commendation to only one person in your party. Give these to people who you think did a really good job. A good teacher, a smart healer who kept everyone alive, or something else to earn a good job sticker in your mind. You get rewards at specific amounts of commendations. Any commendations you get can be seen in your character panel's reputation tab. But commendations are less about the reward and more about letting people know you think they did a good job. They won't know it came from you, but they'll know they got a commendation at the end of every instance. But that tangent aside, beating the first guild hest unlocks the second, and gives us guild hest roulette. Roulettes are in their own section of the duty finder. They will put you in a random duty based on what you have unlocked within the parameters of the roulette. Naturally, Guild Hest Roulette is all Guild Hests. I've showed you one Guild Hest, so instead, I'll withdraw from the Roulette from the Duty window, and move on to two more important bits at level 10. Next is the result of our level 10 class quest. Completion of this class quest allows us to join all of the other guilds in the game, and gives us the ability to make gear sets. So let's use the Archer's Guild for example. Here I'll join the Archer's Guild and be able to become one. Next we can open up the character window and we have a new button to open up the gear set panel. Clicking the plus button in the gear set panel will create a gear set of our currently equipped gear. Selecting this gear set will automatically equip every piece of gear saved to this gear set. We can also drag it to our hotbars which I'll recommend having a 4th or even 5th hotbar set aside for gear set swapping. This is especially useful for once you get higher level and start doing stuff like gathering and crafting. But anyway, now we have Lancer saved, so let's put on the bow and end up mostly naked. Because we've been leveling up and putting on better gear, our level 1 archer can't wear any of it. All classes without exception, start at level 1. Be sure to keep some low level gear around to put on when becoming a new class, and we'll be sure to save this gear set too. Do this 
anytime you get a new class. It makes for very easy swapping between classes and jobs later on. But finally, that covers everything around level 10. That's a lot that all unlocked around level 10, between class quests level 10 and story quests level 10. But think how much is specifically unlocked by the story quest trigger so far. Inns, leaves, guild hests, and there will be so many more things as we go on. If it's not already clear, your level hardly ever matters. Most major features of the game are locked not to your level, but to the level of the story quest completions. There are exceptions of course, like class quest rewards, but a lot of the game is main story locked. Be sure to always be progressing the story. Though there is one more thing we can quickly mention. This blue quest you might have found called Where the Heart Is. All three starting locations have one of these. This is for housing. You can do the quest now, but ignore housing for now. We'll come back to this at level 50. But that was a lot, right? There's been a huge list of unlocks so far. So let's quickly backtrack and get a few quick tips in before moving on. Let's start on a positive note. Death. You may make a mistake and die. If you die and choose to revive, you will be sent back to your home point or to the start of an instance. But you can be revived by another player to avoid this. And in party settings, this is how you should handle death. Mostly healers will be the ones raising you, and you should try and wait for a raise in most cases. But if for some reason you click wait and close the box, you can click the button that has appeared on the right in the notifications area of your UI. I have moved mine, but it all works the same. Click it to reopen the window, and then click revive. Next tip is about aggro icons. On the left we have this blue circle icon. Some people call it an alien head. On the right, we have this weird Triforce kind of icon. Blue alien head means passive, red Triforce means aggro, or more commonly called in this game, enmity. At this beginning phase, you'll be meeting a lot of enemies with the passive icon, but as we level up more and more, the more enemies will aggro us even if we don't attack them. Be wary of this while exploring areas for the first time, especially if they're higher level enemies. A quick clip on my main, this big guy here is called an A rank hunt. He's level 50 and will kill you in one hit. That's why you should pay attention to levels and aggro symbols. And this may even be why you died for the first time. It's how I died the first time I'm pretty sure. If you find one of these, stay far away from it. If it's blocking one of your quests, shout for help, be it from friends, novice network, or you can even try the shout command slash sh. Type something in after it and you'll yell to the entire zone that you need help. You'll also want to use the position command. This posts your map coordinates in the chat in a clickable way that will immediately tell everyone where you are. You can also control plus right click on the map or use both L1 and R1 on the map to create a flag to use the flag command. Clicking on a chat posted map marker will automatically create a flag of that position. This will make finding you and giving you help a lot easier. Another tip is falling. Fall damage itself is never lethal. If you die from a fall, it's because of combat. There's a thin line here, but fall damage is not lethal. But combat damage is lethal, and in combat, all damage is combat damage, which will now include fall damage. So don't fall in a fight, and careful not to get attacked when you land. You will survive with 1 HP as long as you don't begin combat. And I have one more tip. I've glossed over it so far, but we also have chocobo keeps in just about every single place with an aetherite. This is a much cheaper travel option that is amazing to use when you need to go AFK 
but still need to travel. The NPC will safely transport you to your chosen destination for a very cheap gill count. Five gill to return to Gridania over a minute while I go stretch my legs and get a drink? Healthy and useful. Each chocobo keep is only able to go to nearby settlements, and a settlement is only added to the list after you find the chocobo keep of that settlement. So this one in Bent Branch unlocks Bent Branch for other chocobo keeps. But with that huge chunk of new features, we can skip ahead a little finally. Finish up your hunt logs first page if you feel the need to, and be able to start the second and reach level 15. At this point, we'll be getting our final test of our level 1 to 15 tutorial and our level 15 class quest skill. This is the biggest reason why class quests are important. The skills you get. Some classes have an underwhelming class quest skill, like Lancers, but many of them are very important. And these quests are actually the source of a good half of your total toolkit. Get used to doing your class and job quests now. Be sure to do it before progressing much further past your final trial and story advancement. Since your reward is your intro to equipment-based objectives, having to wear an equipment piece to continue, all three paths do one of these, but more importantly, is this is where the paths begin to join up. You put on your equipment piece, watch some story, and become an envoy to visit the other two starting towns with access to the airships now. They're relatively a cheap cost compared to the 400 to 600 gil it would cost to teleport, and now you have free reign to travel across all of the entire base game. We'll visit both other towns by airship thanks to the story, and don't forget to attune to their crystals. Be sure to explore the entire town to get the entire Aether network attuned to. But before we return to Limsa for the true meetup point of all three paths, let's take a short detour to Uldar. In front of the Aetherite Plaza is It Could Happen to You. This quest unlocks the Gold Saucer. This is a minigame area with special events, daily events, weekly events, and events every 20 minutes. It has chocobo racing, Triple Triad, and so much more. It even has Mahjong of all things. I'll go in-depth on this in a later video. But for now, let's actually go back to the story and head back to Limsa Liminsa. Remember that there were eight classes to start as, but there are nine battle classes, and you could only become the final one once completing your level 10 class quests. That's here in Limsa, the Rogues Guild. And across all three areas, we have in total nine battle classes, eight crafting classes, and three gathering classes. Pick any and all classes up as you desire. They're all optional, but I'm sure you'll want to experience all of these systems eventually. And now finally back to the story for It's Probably Pirates, the official meetup point for all starter quest chains. No matter where you started, you'll have met up here for this quest. And you'll find two new blue quests right after, right next to you. Rise to the Challenge will take you to the same place as your story. Beauty is only Scalp Deep takes you nearby. And then we'll send you to all three towns. You can do the objective here on Limsa, but hold off on doing the Ulda and Gridania parts of it for later. Head down to where the story needs you to go, and we'll find the completion for the challenge log. The challenge log resets every Tuesday and is a weekly list of, well, challenges. Each one gives great rewards for doing each of its tasks, and you'll unlock many more entries as we continue, which we're about to find more entries as we head to Aleport for our first dungeon. Remember to talk to the Chocobo Keep and the Aetherite before moving on. Before we get to the dungeon, first we get taken to the Novice Hall. Even if you never touch the Novice Network, you need to do this. Talk to the NPC and then talk to the Smith to unlock the Novice Hall itself. This is a set of training exercises. They're not quite accurate to a real situation, 
but they reward you with some very good gear. And the final trial gives you a special ring. All battle classes under level 30 will now get 30% more experience while wearing it. This is similar to the earring I've been wearing, but it's something all of you can also get. Also, the gear you get, ring aside, changes based on the class you do the training exercises as. A mage class will get mage gear, while a tank will get tank gear, instead of the physical DPS set that I got and am now wearing. But with a full set of gear boosting our power greatly, let's head over to Sestasha. We're ready for our first dungeon. They call them instanced raids? But don't worry, it's nothing that intense. Let's go! Oh. Uh... Depending on your role and the time of day, you might have a non-zero queue time. So, uh, while you wait, go do something else. There's tons to do. It's a brand new world. Level another battle class up, learn a craft, or as I'm going to be showing you next time, let's learn gathering. See you next time for a beginner's primer on how to be a gatherer. Thanks for watching Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. There was a lot in this video, and I mean a lot to learn. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. This might be a 50 minute video for what is only the first few hours of the game, but there is so much more to learn and do. Feel free to ask questions on anything you didn't understand, or suggest stuff to bring up later. See you all for some relaxing gathering, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies.